thank you very much um, <clears throat> for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, a topic that um, stirred my uh, imagination and also um, pushed me to have some practical stuff to do in my agency. First of all, um, I was actually sent to this school uh, with a very clear mandate. Two years ago, we created a PR company that spinned off from a full services agency. And my mandate was to create the best PR possible company on Earth, planet, universe, and whatever. And uh, since then, I wanted to learn and do things in this direction, not only for the company, but also for myself, thinking that probably uh, there will be a moment when I will retire and I want this company to live longer than me and secondly to learn from this school something that I could actually uh, learn after that period from let's say personal purposes or other businesses that um, I might uh, uh, join later so the topic of my thesis is leadership 2.0 and the biggest question in my mind is was why is everybody talking about technology what is so hot about technology that I don't get actually. I'm not a technology person and I'm not going to become such a person. And I think that um, what's happening now in this field is very interesting from the leadership point of view. And what happened 30 years ago when the internet was actually invented uh, starts to, to show some effects in the society right now. And I always had in mind this metaphor, this short story of discovering the size of the universe with this nice lady in the bottom who actually discovered how to measure the distance between two stars, stars depending on how bright they are. And 30 years later this man came and uh, um, applied her method and find out how to actually look at the universe and how small we are in this universe and how many things are happening around us. Well, it seems like technology is the same story and my assumption is that 2.0 is the alternative thinking for the next innovation model. But there is a big question, the, a big hypothesis that I follow, uh, that technology changes the leadership framework and behavior itself. So it's something beyond technology that it changes. And there are two change agents probably that I identified in this uh, moment. The first is the, the technology itself, and the second is the wealth, defined generically. Speaking about um, technology, I tried to find out what's within the technology framework that pushed some learnings outside or beyond it. And I saw an exponential growth starting probably 2001, 2002, when Google search started to be very much used worldwide. And I see that it's very hard to keep up with this exponential growth now and in the future. Some, some important things happened within and beyond the technology framework. The first one is, of course, the emergence of Web uh, 2.0 as a superior form of communication. The second is the emergence of Twitter revolutions and YouTube voters and I was uh, thinking of myself as a person born or actually educated uh, after a TV revolution in our country. I'm so much uh, uh, linked with this and I'm thinking about my son probably having so much to do with the internet and uh, uh, being educated in this spirit that I actually can't tell him much more than he already knows. Then the emergence of the kids of the baby boomers, the persons that I uh, uh, told you about before or the net generation and this person that makes us uh, very unhappy sometimes, the angry Jim I call him. I actually um, experienced some situations with a lot of angry Jims and in my positions we do deal a lot of angry, with angry Jims uh, in our job. Then the second factor is the wealth factor and how it challenges leadership. And everything in my um, story started with the introduction of the T model, Ford T, which actually laid the foundation for the future consumerist growth 
for the introduction of the uh, production line, for the introduction of the distribution model, for the introduction of the desire of everybody to own something. But this actually uh, uh, led us to a point where it's very hard also to keep up with this exponential growth. I found this interesting figure about the worldwide GDP in 2007 that I can't even read. I can tell you it's a 15 figure something, US dollars. Probably is lower right now, but it's going to, to, to be this way in the future. And what we see is that for a very long period of time, since they have records, nothing happened. It's like the word didn't exist. And what happened after the, uh, the beginning of the last century is a growth that uh, uh, probably it was very easy to, 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 to keep pass with, but right now it's very, uh, very hard. I should stay near. What is this going to do with leadership? I think wealth is leadership because wealth creation is the product of a simple but profoundly powerful three-step formula. Differentiate, select and amplify. This is the formula of the evolution in the Darwinian approach probably and in the new approach as well. And my big question is how to sustain an exponential growth of wealth in a world with exponential growth of technology. And I discovered three paradig paradigm shifts. The first one is the lowest value on market, meaning that the less of bis a business charges, the more money it generates. This is the example of Google probably. This is the example of eBay, of Amazon, and a lot of other technology companies, I have to admit this. Uh, but they created something interesting in terms of charging less and generating customer volume to create wealth. The second paradigm shift is the post-scarcity economy, or the less a business owns, the more value it presumably creates. This is the example of um, uh, also uh, a lot of other technology companies that rely very much on the consumer experience, on the consumer amplifying what they are doing in their own uh, yard. The third paradigm shift is I think there is no particular hero in charge with leadership and that leadership is organizational design that transcends a given leader and this is something that I learned in this school and I try to apply very much and I'm thinking about myself and about this company 50 years from now on, what it will be, how it will be run, if my name will be staying there on the door. So with these three ideas in mind, I identify three ages of the enterprises and accordingly three models of the leadership. And if you look in the business world today, you will see all of them existing all together. The first one is when everybody wants to own something and they keep it very close to their heart and they don't want to give it up. So it's the moment when they build uh, uh, or accumulate tangible assets built around the definite scope of work called core business. And to do this, they create a linear creation, value creation in a chain uh, that they control and own from the beginning until the end. And what is interesting about this kind of company is that it is very disciplined, it is very military organized, and it creates mass market products and services. Well, in the same time, we see companies appearing when they uh, hunt for intangible assets, for people, for patents, for R&D, that actually they still want to own and they still want to explore and expand their uh, scope of work. And this company is based on a formal structure uh, built on hierarchy. They introduced meritocracy, entrepreneurship, uh, knowledge management, but they still keep the kind of corporate secrecy and they are still closed companies. These companies create target market products and services and to me the best example is Microsoft. Finally, I didn't catch the third uh, part of this, uh, of this movie but I will see it when I'm coming back. What happens today is that businesses have to curate worldwide assets by creating collaboration platforms that aggregate, aggregate resources. This company uses their assets as a platform and they aggregate around a lot of peers to produce 
products for what I call mesh-up aggregate market products and services. And what you will see here in terms of formal structure and informal structure is very much <coughs> identified or labeled by the internet. Hierarchies instead of hierarchies, uh, crowdcasting, craigslistification, uh, always in beta. And in terms of informal structure, you see uh, li uh, search linking, aggregating, and this kind of flexibility, high flexibility level. So there are, in my opinion, five elements that drive leadership 2.0. The first one is the openness or making the company borders virtual. This seems that you are very much in the position to move from one core business to another during the time. And there are some examples in my thesis that sustain this uh, statement. The second one is the peering or building and using collective intelligence to actually deliver more and to actually deliver relevant products and services. The third one is the synergy, or what I call integrating what is happening at the edge of your business into your business. And there is a very interesting discussion that I had with my colleagues in the agency, and I tried to apply them, you will see later how, um, of watching not only what's your core, uh, uh, core uh, let's say, um, business, but also seeing around it, seeing what's happening in the society. There, is, there must be a gravity factor or what keeps everything organized and not linked but organized around a single idea, a given framework. The third factor is acting globally. We always have to think that we are always in a global competition and what happens in Cannes is that you see ideas from another country or from another industry that might solve the problem that you might have with the client, for instance. So my research to find out this, uh, uh, these ideas was very much based on reverse engineering, I call it like this, because it's impossible right now to, to ask somebody about leadership 2.0 without explaining what exactly is. So it would have been impossible actually to research by traditional methods. But I tried to split the leadership 2.0 into its core elements and to find companies that act towards this, uh, this direction. The first example is an old guy, PNG. It's not a I actually have only one example from technology, which is a bad example, just uh, serving me to, to understand what to avoid in my approach. And um, I discovered something interesting about this company in terms of becoming a curator of intellectual assets. What I wanted to do is talk about this ball because um, to me this is a key metaphor for connections and what we're trying to accomplish and in it are points of light. And so the complexity of the ball to me really represents how complex the world is and how connected and cross-linked it is. You cannot believe the number of unanticipated places that you can connect to. So what you've got to do is to take this very compelling idea the philosophy is built upon the fundamental idea that you can combine internal and external assets that you create new products and services for consumers and you leverage the ideas and capabilities of the world create economic value. So for me, the strategy is connect and develop. And to implement connect and develop, we're talking then about it being something that's led from the top. It's a culture change. Probably most importantly, it's a culture change. It's not a magic wand. It's, let's do it. It has to be enabled. It has to be enacted. And the fundamental way that to go about implementing it in the organization is following a very, very deliberate process. And that starts with the mandates, the vision, where to play, how to win, capabilities, and governance. Mandate is 
we need more organic top line growth. And the next issue is to get clear on what's our vision, what's the vision for delivering on this mandate. And uh, AG Lab uh, basically uh, articulated a vision for the couple of hundred innovations that Procter put in the market every year that at least half of those innovations would have a major you know, technology, package, device, whatever it might be, connection to the outside world. So rather than trying to invent everything ourselves, we would be both on an invention and a connection strategy, and those two things would combine together. Most organizations identify their um, intellectual assets as what they own inside. So they create communities of practice, and they would go about uh, sort of documenting their knowledge, uh, what they have, and a lot of that is sort of backward looking. What you need to do is define your intellectual base, not as what you know, but it's what you know plus who you know. So it's know who and know how. To focus on the top 10 problems that need to be solved for your customers in each one of your businesses. So putting in place a very deliberate strategy of identifying the top 10 needs is very important. And then finally, the last piece of this is governance. There are a lot of governance elements around intellectual property and how do you manage what you say to the outside world. So governance is a major aspect of this. What's very interesting about this company is that they not only um, bring in inventions created outside, but they also bring out inventions created within the company, and sometimes there are their competitors that actually acquire them. Well, coming back, I have an example of how Facebook failed to become a curator of applications and then learned something and improved. Uh, it's the moment when they actually introduced the applications two years ago, I think, and um, at the beginning they created a kind of mass chaos because users were very much annoyed by <coughs> being spammed with a lot of applications that they were not interested in. Uh, and the reason uh, they did it, it was because they didn't create the right framework. And in my opinion, that framework, framework should have been a validation system that they uh, uh, involved or applied later in terms of how much people do uh, access this kind of applications, should we keep them, should we keep them, and so on. Well, here comes my role because um, I want to learn and do things from this, uh, from this experience. And I created what I call a beta model. It's not the final one, it's the work in progress one for my company, starting with uh, the learnings that I have acquired. So the first thing is to actually establish the framework, the, the kind of mandate. What, what exactly are you called in for? Is it a growth need? Is it a profitability need? Is it my only satisfaction? What exactly is there? And in my case, I was required to create sustainable growth, meaning that growth that not now happens, but also in the future cash flow growth that can be sold to somebody some moment in the future. So it's easy to create growth, but it's not easy to create profit because growth comes with the expansion of the assets that you have. You, you need actually to generate that, uh, that growth. The second thing that you have to think about is how to harness your core values. And speaking about this, you have to focus on critical value drivers and to think, to actually ask or raise these questions to yourself. And then to add value through orchestration. 
And I like very much the answer that um, uh, John Haggerty gave us in London uh, with the club agency, actually. We are all club agencies today. So coming back to my business, I identify that my club is creating headlines, basically. And we are spin doctors. And in our process, we sometimes find some true things that might be embarrassing for our clients that we try to repackage, unpackage, or package. And this is the beauty of our job in a way, but we discovered that we also need to link with the edge values and to see the markets as conversations and to tap into the intellectual capital of our customers. So before we used to be an agency that worked for the clients. Now we are an agency that works for the consumers because we discovered that my club is very well connected with the society agenda. If you want to create a headline, you have to know what people are interested in. And starting from this, we identified that probably our club should be not anymore about generating headlines but about creating headlines uh, but, but about uh, being the kind of society therapist, I mean, identifying some issues in the society and finding clients to, uh, uh, to solve them after that. And there is a last part of harnessing your workforce talent because you cannot work without that. So what you have to do is probably to turn the workplace into a workpedia. And this means that you have to make to create the culture and the environment for the people to develop themselves in towards this way and to create platforms for collective intelligence and to create those hierarchies I was speaking about at the beginning. So right now my company looks like this but there is another element that I need to add this kind of gravity or alignment that I need to be sure that what's within the circle is my business I'm not interested in outside. So the alignment model right now in the beta is that my strategy is the company that serves communities of interest by solving their, in, uh, their issues on their agenda. So I'm very much interested in understanding what my people, my society is concerned about to actually uh, create some tasks of uh, uh, capturing the consumer conversations not only online but also offline to articulate and update public issues, to identify clients that, might, um, that uh, may address these issues and then go to find, to transform ourselves into a kind of client curator, meaning that, okay, we identified an issue, now we need a client to this. What's on the market? Is there any, anything on the market like this? And then uh, we created a kind of consumers advisory board, meaning that we put consumers, our mothers, our friends, our uh, relatives, to somehow advise us in a way to create a product or a service and solve that problem. Then uh, there is another element, important element that I actually started with when I created the company is the culture. And because I'm a very open person and very much live, I do not like to make so many plans. I do, I, I do make plans while I'm applying them. I think that our culture is very much participatory, it's a life culture, it's a beta culture, and it's a culture of learning from mistakes. I uh, uh, deliberately cultivate mistakes to understand by re-engineering them what is wrong and how we can improve this actually. In the people side, we are a kind of talent curator and I remember I heard the chairman of the Vienna um, Opera House uh, being asked how do you actually raise the artist? How do you get the talents in, in, your, in your company? And he said, I'm not interested in keeping them here forever. I go to the countries where I find great artists, but they are not expensive. I make a uh, commitment with them for two or three years, and then they know that having been worked there uh, here in my, uh, in my company, they may go everywhere after that. And I also try to hire or to find, uh, find people that are specialists in people and not in discipline. So, so far I was hiring people that were very good in relationship with media, with key opinion leaders, with, you know, these kind of people that makes you the headline. 
Right now I'm interested more in people that are very much connected into the, the society. So the questions that I raise are, do you have brothers? Uh, how many are you married? Um, do you have a kid? Uh, where do you go during the weekend? Uh, what do you do? What books are you reading? Where do you travel? And things like this to see how much that person is connected with the reality. And almost not to forget about the gravity factor <laughs> we put everything inside believing that we are a kind of society therapist and this is a kind of mutual understanding between us it's not nothing that we shout we treat the illnesses of the society or the, uh, everything that goes wrong we know that we are all here in this club because we know something about our people and want to, to actually solve I'm very thankful to all the people that helped me um, refine my ideas, find my way, help my company grow sustainable, sustainable. and uh, I'm very thankful to, to, to all my colleagues from which I picked up ideas, insights and uh, good lessons for, for my agency. Thank you.